When you look at this photo, what do you see? Do you see that? That's a leaf mantis. Notice how it's highly camouflaged. You can barely see it in the leaf litter where it hangs out, where it lives, in its habitat. It is highly evolved to not be easily seen in that habitat. How did it get this way? Natural selection. Evolution by natural selection. What is evolution? It's the change in populations or species over time. That's all it is. Evolution simply means change over time. And species change over time. Populations change over time. But something to note that is a misconception is that individuals do not evolve. Individuals do not change over time when we're talking about biological evolution. We are most certain that populations and species evolve. All the evidence points towards that. We call it a theory, but a theory is that of which we are certain. So who was Charles Darwin? Did he invent evolution? Absolutely not. Evolution had been around for a long time before Darwin, but what he did come up with was how species change over time, the mechanism of evolution, known as natural selection. That's why we revere him, revere him. Nobody had been able to explain how species change over time until he put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Natural, there are other mechanisms of evolutionary change, but natural selection seems to be the most significant, the most important mechanism how, of how species and populations change over time. So. How did he come up with this idea? Well, it pretty much began with a voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle, Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle, from England across the Atlantic to South America, along the coast of South America, because their, their intent, the whole reason that they went on this voyage, or part of the reason anyway, was to map the coastline of South America. They also stopped off in the Galapagos Islands, and then they proceeded across the Pacific Ocean and stopped off in New Zealand and Australia and went then went down through the Indian Ocean around the, the tip of Africa back to South America and then back up to England. Five-year voyage around the world but spent a lot of time in South America and the Galapagos and that turned out to be significant for Darwin. All of this says what I just said. Darwin went along as the ship's naturalist. He didn't go along as the cartog cartographer or something to, to help map South America. He went around, he went along as the ship's naturalist because most ships that went out in these days had a naturalist along with them. Uh, kind of like, you know, like we see on uh, the uh, Star Trek TV show in the movie, they've got a science officer. Darwin basically went along as a science officer. But he was extraordinarily skilled at observation and documentation and specimen collection. And he coll so he collected and he drew and he thought and he wrote and he read. Um, but the, the most significant places that they stopped were South America, to Darwin anyway, was South America and the Galapagos Islands. And the islands, turns out islands are really good for finding evidence of evolution. Um, and Darwin wasn't the only one that came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. Um, but we'll come upon that, that other person farther along. So Darwin did a lot of reading in between stops. <clears throat> um, as the story goes, he was very seasick the entire voyage. And as you can imagine, on one of these old sailing vessels, it took a long time to go anywhere. And again, it was a five-year voyage. So in between stops, he did a lot of reading. One of the uh, books, or at least people that Darwin read about and knew about before he went on his voyage was this guy named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, who lived in the 1700s, which was before Darwin. Uh, and Lamarck had an idea of how species change over time too. It, it's just that he didn't really present any evidence for his theory or hypothesis. 
really should call it a hypothesis. Um, so Lamarck's idea was that species change over time by using or not using different parts of their body. So for example, he would explain that giraffes have a long neck and they evolve their long neck by individual giraffes using their neck to try to reach and stretch higher and higher to get food from higher and higher branches in a tree. And that individual giraffe, which is what this, this figure represents, this is the same giraffe over time, so the arrows represent time passing. And the idea here is that as this giraffe tries to reach branches that are higher up, his neck is growing longer. And it's not shown in this diagram, but the next step would be for this giraffe to then reproduce and have offspring. And his offspring would also have a long neck, be born with a long neck, because that was a characteristic that he had acquired during his lifetime, and he would pass on that characteristic to his offspring. This idea is known as, as um, inheritance of acquired characteristics. That's Lamarck's, that's really the title of Lamarck's hypothesis, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Characteristics that are acquired by uh, individuals through their lifetime are passed on to their offspring. That's the inheritance part of it. So inheritance of acquired characteristics. <clears throat> All of this says what I just said, so I'm not I'm not adding to it. Um, So this is also known as use and disuse, as I mentioned, because it can work the other way too. Just like something becomes longer or stronger or more pronounced if you use it, or if a species uses it or an individual uses it, the opposite can happen too. If a, an organism doesn't use something, then it will become reduced, it will go away. Um, if we look at this diagram, the this is a fiddler crab. And this is supposed to be a, a male fiddler crab. And this is so this is showing the evolution of fiddler crab's large claw. They call them fiddler crabs because they have one large claw that you know somebody thought looked like a fiddle, like a violin, you know. Um, so the idea here is, according to Lamarck, <clears throat> fiddler crabs have a large claw because they used it to wave to the ladies. So this is again a male crab. These are female crabs. The male crab is using his claw to wave to the ladies. And because he's using it in, in that way, it over his lifetime, it grows larger. And this diagram does represent the, the, uh, the last step, and that is the inheritance part of it, that he would pass on that characteristic of a large claw to his offspring. So that was that's Lamarck's idea of inheritance of acquired characteristic. He's not correct. He wasn't right. Um, because we now know, because of Charles Darwin, that natural selection is how species change over time. So he really didn't have any evidence to support this. No experimental evidence, no observational evidence, really. Um, all he was doing was guessing. He made an inference. However, <clears throat> there's been a recent discovery known as epigenetics that is similar to Lamarck's idea. And we'll, we'll come back to that idea when we study genetics, but in a nutshell, the idea is that there are changes to your DNA that result from things that you do during your lifetime that can be passed on to your offspring. So in other words, if you choose to smoke cigarettes, for example, that's making changes to your DNA that will be passed on to your children. Something to think about. Another person that Darwin might have been reading about or would have been reading about uh, is James Hutton, who was a ge geologist. And he lived again in the 1700s before Darwin. Uh, and his, yeah, so he, he observes the slow processes, uh, you know, the earth, how the earth changes very slowly. And based on those observations, he theorized that the earth is much older than scientists of his day thought because uh, uh, scientists of the day kind of went with the church's explanation or religious explanation for the age of the earth, which is only a few thousand years old. But 
the evidence from uh, Hutton's observations suggested that the Earth is much, much older. So his, the name of his theory is known as gradualism. And the idea is you can apply that to plate tectonics. Um, as you know, all the continents 200 million years ago were all together in this supercontinent continent known as Pangaea. And from that time, they've been drifting apart, farther and farther apart. And we can actually measure that. Measure that. Uh, they're drifting apart at about the same speed that your fingernails grow, about two centimeters a year. Um, that's the idea of gradual change. And for the Earth to change so gradually, that means the Earth and, and the changes have become so great, like the distance that the, the continents are now apart from each other, that suggests that the Earth is much, much older than just a few thousand years. So this was important to Darwin's thinking because macroevolution, and this is the first time I've used that term, so let me explain that. Macroevolution are big evolutionary changes in species or populations um, over time. But really, you should think of, of the big changes in species. Like, for example, one species change, uh, giving rise to new species. So macroevolution, I mean, that's really the biggest kind of change that can happen is one species giving rise to another species or changing over time enough to be considered a different species. That's macroevolution. And it's a very gradual process and it requires a long time. So the Earth being very old was an important piece of the puzzle for Darwin to realize. Also the idea that since the Earth has changed so much over time, species would have had to have also changed over time in order to survive on the changing Earth. A contemporary of Darwin was Charles Lyell. So notice the date, 1830. That's around when Darwin lived and, and did his work. So that's the word contemporary means at the same time. He was also a geologist like Hutton, and he built on Hutton's work. So he was aware of Hutton's work, obviously. And he observed and theorized that the slow processes that Hutton described that changed the Earth over millions of years are still operating today. So his theory is known as uniformitarianism, so which simply means that the same processes that were operating in the past are operating today. They're uniform. They don't change. The, the mechanisms or the forces that shaped the Earth in millions of years ago are the same as the forces that are shaping the Earth today. Uniformitarianism. An example would be the uh, processes that form mountains and then erode them away. So here we see the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains used to look like the Rocky Mountains, but they don't anymore because they've been eroded away over millions of years. Um, so that's one example, and that's still happening. The erosion is still taking place. The Appalachian Mountains are still eroding away, as are the Rocky Mountains. Eventually the Rocky Mountains will look like the Appalachian Mountains. Same with the Grand Canyon. The Colorado River is what cut the Grand Canyon, and it's continuing to cut the Grand Canyon today. All the particles, all the sediments, all the rock that's being eroded away and carried down the Colorado River is still happening. And in that way, the Grand Canyon's still getting bigger. <clears throat> so this was important to Darwin because if uh, species have evolved in the past, they are continuing to evolve today. That's one application of the idea of uniformitarianism. So just like the Earth, the same forces that changed the Earth in the past are changing the Earth today, the same forces that changed species in the past are still changing species today, which is, uh, you know, very different from what they thought at the time. Even, you know, scientists, again, went along with the religious idea that species were created and then they don't change. That once they're created, they stay the same forever. And then this is the same, this, this last concept here is the same idea that I pointed out on the previous slide with Hutton, that if the Earth has, cha has changed over billions of years, then life has to have changed along with it in order to survive, in order to not go extinct. Thomas Malthus, uh, again, lived basically and, and worked a little bit before Darwin's time, uh, but Darwin was reading about Malthus, and Malthus is actually an economist. And he uh, observed that human population, he was concerned about human population growth. Even back at this time, in the late 1700s, he was worried about human population growth and how, it, if it continued, that we would run out of everything. 
that people would run out of food and water and space. Um, so he was the first to propose that idea. That's the idea of a carrying capacity. In other words, uh, there's only uh, a certain size population that an ecosystem can support. So, for example, the fur seals here, uh, they're breeding on an island, and they need space in order to breed and raise their young. So there's competition for that space. And it's an island, so the amount of space is limited. So all this competition for space eventually causes the population to level off, in this case at about 10,000, because there's no more space on the island for more fur seals to breed. So their population levels off. That's, uh, so where it levels off, that's the carrying capacity, carrying capacity of 10,000. What causes them to level off, what causes the population to stop growing and level off is known as a limiting factor. So in this case, the limiting factor is space, space for breeding and rearing young. So this is important to Darwin's thinking because it introduced the idea of struggle for existence. Struggle for existence between individuals of a species competing for limited resources. So only some would survive, not all would survive, so only certain ones would survive. And it, and if we go on and, and think about evolution and natural selection, the ones that survived were the ones that were best suited to survive in their habitat. That's the whole idea of natural selection. So Darwin took this idea that Malthus was applying to humans. He didn't apply it to fur seals, but he was applying this to humans. And here's the uh, graph of hum human population growth and what's happened to human population growth over the last couple thousand years. It's shot up big time. It's, growing exponentially and still going up and up and up. Um, but Darwin figured, okay, if this is true for humans, if, if we need to worry about humans running out of resources and competing against each other for these resources, then we, we must also apply that to other species as well. So that was another piece of the puzzle that, that really fed into Darwin's thinking and coming up with the whole idea of natural selection. 